Alright, hello and welcome. Today, we have an iPod Classic 5th Gen that has no audio coming out of the headphone jack. And now, this is a very common issue on the iPod Classic 5th Gens. Probably the most common board repair issue. And it can be fixed just by re-soldering this little chip here. What ends up happening is it just comes detached from the board over time. And then, yeah, just you get no audio. Sometimes you can even test if it's that issue just by simply grabbing one of these and then pressing down on it and sometimes the audio will come back while you're pressing on it but first things first let's actually plug a headphone jack in and see that that is the real issue because um the customer may have just misdiagnosed something so let's test that out first plugging this in yeah headphone jack flex let's get some sort of hard drive plugged in there as well all right let's get this one plugged in uh, give it a restore with iTunes. Alright, so here we go. We've got the iPod restored and we've got some music loaded up onto it. So, sometimes when we get this glitch, we can still get the uh, button click noises coming through the headphone jack. So, I'm going to test that first. It doesn't sound like it's coming through, but I can hear that little shh white noise sound coming through. And yeah, the music doesn't play at all. So, I can hear that the headphones are plugged in and that there is some sort of a signal going to them. But there's just no music and no clicks. But if we push on this, sometimes it can come back. Not this time. So yeah, what we're going to have to do is remove that chip, reflow it, or replace it. Which is probably what I'll end up doing. And then soldering it back on. So now over to the soldering iron. I might film myself just disassembling this as well. We want to get the iPod fully disassembled for something like this. Alright, so first thing what we got to do, as you can see, there's a bunch of this underfill type of stuff in that area. It's like this rubbery sort of substance. we got to pull that off first. So how we can do that, we can just heat it up to not very hot. I put it on like maybe 120 degrees Celsius. And then just sort of scrape around it and it'll come off pretty easily. So let's try doing that first. I don't know how well you'll be able to see this on the camera. As I said in the last video, I'll be getting a... Uh, microscope camera soon so you'll get a better views of this stuff in the future but for now gotta work with what we have so yeah i'm just using what's called a hot air rework station on about 120 degrees just heating this up slightly and now we can use our tweezers and just scrape it off i might need to heat it a bit more than that can put down some captain tape in the surrounding areas so we don't cause any damage to the rest of the components. All right, now just applying some flux paste in the area. We can put our hot air rework station at a much higher temperature. Put it at 375 or something like that. Although the temperature I use doesn't really matter for you because it's different based on each machine and for a bunch of different reasons. You gotta just find what works for you. So I actually did get a microscope camera in the time since I recorded this video. It ended up coming a few weeks later. And then I had another one of these logic boards which I had to do the same repair on so I thought I'd film it under the microscope. And I'll just insert some clips of that repair now in this video as well. Um, yeah, so now we're just taking this chip off. So just applying the heat and then wait until it starts flowing and you can slowly lift it off like that. And as you'll notice, there's still underfill underneath the chip. So we're going to have to remove that carefully. Um, so yeah, just getting your tweezers and while it's still hot, just prying it off slowly like that. You want to be really careful not to actually pry off any of the uh, solder pads underneath because if you do that, you can rip a trace off the logic board. And if you do that, it's pretty much toast. They are technically repairable, but it's just very difficult at that stage. So yeah, now what we want to do is get some new leaded solder and just rub it all over these old pads to replace what was there before with just some new fresh solder. 
it'll just make it flow a whole lot more easily and it'll just be a lot better when we go to solder the new chip back in. So yeah, now just giving that whole area a spray and a wipe down with isopropyl alcohol. And yeah, now we got to find another logic board that has a, uh, a good chip on it. So I'm just looking through all my other iPod Classic logic boards that have other defects on them. And yeah, I'll just find one that still has that chip in place and we'll use that one as our donor board. Um, yeah, but I don't think you always actually have to replace the chip itself. I was just doing that as a extra measure because I'm pretty sure the reason that the audio stops playing on this is just because, yeah, the joint becomes weak and the chip starts lifting off the board. So I'm pretty sure you can just reflow the exact same chip and then solder it back on. And most of the time it should still work. Um, but yeah, I didn't want to go through that whole process just to find out um, that it was the chip itself that was broken when I have a bunch of donor boards on hand anyways. So I thought I'd just use one of the uh, chips off another board. So here's me now desoldering another chip from, again, another logic board. And we've now got that off. Yeah, but we can't just solder this one straight back on to our original logic board. We got to first reball it on the bottom here. So I know if you've watched electronics repair videos like this before, you may see people use like a little stencil to reball chips like this, but it's not really necessary in this case. This chip's extremely small. So, and there's only five uh, solder pads on the bottom anyways. So what we can do is we can just flood it with flux and then just get our soldering iron with some solder on it and just run it all over the bottom until you have a good amount of solder on each one of the pads just get it so it looks semi even i guess yeah and if you haven't already figured out you will 100 percent need a microscope to do this you can't really do this repair with the naked eye or even with like a basic magnifying glass so yeah this is a bit of a more complex repair here and yeah not the type of thing you'd pull off on the first go if you've never um micro soldered like this before but anyways, we've got it in place now and you want to make sure it's in the right orientation as well. Um, there is some text on it and there's also a little dot in the corner to keep note of the orientation. So you can just look at my screen to know the correct orientation, I guess. And then, yeah, putting it in place, putting some hot air on it and just, yeah, getting it in place like this. As you can see, when, when the solder underneath starts flowing and you're pushing it around, it'll sort of grab back into the, uh, grab back into place, as you can see there. Um, so yeah, when the solder's all flowing, yeah, it'll move it into the place that it needs to be in. Uh, but yeah, now we've got that soldered back on. Now we just got to clean everything up. So just giving it a spray with isopropyl alcohol. All right, but anyways, let's give this thing a test now at this stage. So first let's remove this tape and we can give the board a bit of a clean because it's looking pretty fluxy at the moment. Yeah, but as you can see, that's a little chip back in the place there. I'll just spray it with alcohol and use a bit of toilet paper to pat it down. Alright, back to the other camera. Let's see if it even powers on. It does. Oh yeah, we got to plug the headphones in if we want to test the headphone jack. Clicker still clicks. Oh! Listen to that. All right, now let's see if it, the audio actually sounds normal. Lovely. <laughs> so there we go. Now we've got audio back on this iPod Classic 5th Gen. So as you can see, it's a pretty difficult repair. Very tiny, and you need the full-on setup to do this. You can't really do this on a $20 soldering iron, unfortunately. You will need a microscope and a hot air rework station. And the ability to know how to use it, which is the hardest part. But if you do have this issue, which is probably one of the most common issues for the iPod Classic 5th Gen, as you can see, it is definitely fixable. So yeah, this logic board was actually for a customer, so I will be sending this iPod back to them now, and they can do the rest of the repairs. Usually I recommend sending the whole iPod so I can reassemble it for you and get everything installed properly and stuff. But I'm pretty sure the guy who booked this repair has his own phone repair store, so I'm sure they'll be fine getting it back together. So yeah, if you've got an iPod with this issue and you want me to fix it, you can book a mail-in repair here on my website. You can send it in and I can fix it for you. Or I'd probably charge maybe like 70 Australian plus the postage. So at that stage, 
it might be more worth it for you to just buy a replacement logic board depending what iPod you have. Yeah, this is only for the 5th gen as well. The 6th uh, and 7th gens, they don't have that specific chip in that specific spot. So I don't think they suffer from the same issue that the 5th gens do here. But yeah, if you do want to get a get your iPod fixed, yeah, you can book on my website or just send me an email. Or if you've got any other iPod you want to get fixed, you can book a mail and repair on my website for that as well. If you want me to add Bluetooth to your iPod, you can do that as well. Yeah, but for this specific repair, it might be easier to just buy another used iPod because sometimes you can get those on eBay or Marketplace or something like that for not too much. Although they are getting more and more expensive these days and I expect that to continue on into the future since they're just so sought after. So, yeah, when I first got into iPods, you could get broken ones for like 20 bucks or less. But, yeah, it sucks. They're kind of pushing 100 or more even. So, yeah, just whatever makes more sense for you, I guess. But if you send it in, I just have so much experience doing this stuff that I'll be able to get it working for you no matter what. So that's the benefit you get from sending it in to me to get me to do it. So if you like this video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, check out my other videos. I got tutorials fixing pretty much every single iPod. Hope to see you next time and bye.